couldn't handle Get ready for a battle Cause you know Tell your neighbor you made it. You made it. God has brought you to the house today. And it's not by coincidence you're here. It's because God is preparing you for the good work. He's preparing the body of Christ for the good work. And I want to thank all the staff, all the team who made it happen throughout the week that we were out ministering in Puerto Rico. Um, it was an experience. It's an experience that we'd like to experience more often. Uh, we took a break while we were there, but we still had to prepare for a few days of ministry. We spent uh, three days in ministry there while we were there for the seven days. Uh, and we saw an outpour of the Spirit of God. We saw God at work. But we're also seeing an outpour of the Spirit of God here at the Holy One Church. And we're excited for the work that God is doing in the house of the Lord. We're excited for every one of you that is experiencing the presence of God. How many of you have been experiencing the presence of God? More than anything, uh, we heard my brother Pete preach last week about hearing the word and, and, and recognizing the word and the voice of God and knowing that the, that, that the enemy is really quick to rob us of our voice, right? How the enemy is real quick to rob you of your voice. He's there to, to remove your, your, your identity, to, to defamate you, to destroy you, mostly to distract you from the good work. Uh, we know what the enemy's strategy is, is to steal, to kill, destroy. And unfortunately, we live in a time right now where Christians don't know how to fight the battle. There's more time spent with, with soldiers beating each other up using scripture to defeat each other. And, and, and I will encourage you today, if you have found yourself using scripture to knock on somebody or to beat them down or to, to make your point without putting the name of that person, you're not doing the good work. <laughs> There's just no way. I would actually encourage you, just like we as pastors are transparent, like, I like to say, if I got something to say, I'll tell it to your face, right? Uh, wouldn't you appreciate that if somebody would just tell you what, what needs to be said rather than using the scripture, whether it's in Romans or John or, or some scripture where, where David in a psalm is, is saying, if, if, Lord, if you would just rip the teeth out of my enemy, right? You know? You know, you, 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 there'll be scriptures used and you're thinking of the enemy, which is, who's our enemy? Satan, right? But you just had lunch with your friends and you left and there's a comment and you're thinking, oh my Lord, and a scripture goes up and you're like, man, are they talking about me or what's going on? And the reality is this, we as a body of Christ need to realize who our real enemy and tell your neighbor, you're not my enemy. You are not my enemy. We have been... The reality is that every one of us need to realize that you don't have to be appointed by man if you are called by God. Uh-oh. I'll take you that one clap right now, but I'll slow it down for estos mexicanos. You don't have to be appointed by man if you are called by God. You don't have to be appointed. In other words, you don't got to wait for somebody to tell you what to do or how to do it if God has called you to it. And God is calling every one of us to rise up. But, but the reality is this. One way to evaluate where you're going and how, how, how you're going to make a difference is to realize what you pray about. Because what you pray about reflects what you believe about God. What you pray determines and identifies who you are. So if your prayer is always pessimistic, uh-oh, 
Not optimistic, but pessimistic, constantly negative. Lord, Lord, if you would just do this and you would always do that, it's falling apart. The sky is always falling for you. Then, then, then you believe about God that he's not the God of, of the valley. You, you may know him as the God of the mountain, but not the God of the valley. The God, the God that was there in the boat that could calm the storms. So if you know that about God, then you would not spend all the time crying wolf. Hello. You would not spend all that time asking for things that God already knows he's going to handle in your life. Welcome all the new guests to the Holy One Church. We want to welcome every one of you. If you are here for the first time or for the second. The reality is this. We, what, what, what. What we're doing is building up people and building up them up for the good work. And last week, we, uh, the week before that, we started a series called The Good Work. Tell your neighbor the good work. The good work is, is, is a series on Nehemiah that is going to guide us to realize what we need to do. When all our walls have been torn down, when you've been destroyed, when you've been exposed... When you've been put in a situation, what you thought was in hiding, Nebuchadnezzar comes and destroys your walls, destroys your fortress, destroys your schools, destroys your family. And this is what Nebuchadnezzar did 500 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. See, God is at work. And when we read the Old Testament and the New Testament, you got to realize this. The Old Testament is still all about Jesus, it's Jesus is, it will manifest through the scriptures Have you realize the grace and the mercy that God has that even though, and I always tell this and I warn the church constantly, if God allowed for Nebuchadnezzar to destroy and to kill all of his people, why are we exempt? Why are we exempt? No, it's because we're going to be raptured and some of us, some of you are going to be in tribulation. Others not going to be. I tell you this, you're not exempt from the tribulation. You're not exempt from the trials. But I'll tell you this, we have a promise. Tell your neighbor, we have a promise. We have a hope, and that hope is in the blood of Jesus, that if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you die today, you never really die. You have eternal life, and that eternal life is found in Jesus Christ. And the Word of God tells us this, if you seek to save your life, you will lose it. So we know that even if all nuclear war breaks out, and every one of us is, is just gone from this earth. We are not gone from eternity. Our, our eternal heaven, uh, our eternal life is in heaven. And heaven will come one day here on earth. I'm fast tracking a lot of little things just to get your mind in the right track. Can Nebuchadnezzar, he, he was in a moment of his life that he might not have fully understood. But he took a moment to ask a question. When was the last time? Husbands, wives, you ask the question, how are you doing? How's everything going? You know, because life right now, it, it don't matter whether you're in a relationship or with, with your children. We have gotten into a society where it's all about ourselves. It's fulfilling our own pleasure. It's fulfilling our own desire. It's fulfilling. And, and the, the life in Christ, it's not about you. It's not whether you feel good. It's not what your plans and your future are. Because the word of God says he gives us a hope. He gives us plans and a future. And the reality is this. If your center of your mind and your heart is not Jesus always, then it's about you. Your your love and your desires and the things in your life will be dictated by what you feel. In that moment when, when, when... Nehemiah was told the news. How many know what happened to him? It broke his heart. And, and, and I want you to search your heart, you know. And, and I'm really guessing that there are things that bother you, right? Are there some things that can bother you? We all get bothered with things, you know. 
But what weighs on you? What, 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 what weighs on, on, on you? What, 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 is a, what is a burden? Is it an injustice? Is it an injustice that bothers you or, 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 or a need? Or maybe someone that is hurting or that has been abused or neglected, you know? What is the burden that moves your heart? What is what disturbs you? What, what upsets you? What makes your blood boil? Come on. What is it? Because a burden you bear often reveals a calling you embrace. The burden that you bear will often reveal the calling that you embrace. And for some of you, you, you just have nothing in your, ha- uh, your, your mind. It's just a cloud, an empty cloud. Today we're going to fill that cloud with Jesus, with purpose. You're, you're, you're not just here to do things. You're here to do the good work. And that good work involves Jesus always in it. So you're, you're, you're set up. Now, now, as Christians, and unfortunately, getting back to the way I opened this, is that we are fighting ourselves. You know, vivimos en un tiempo donde todos nosotros somos criticones, right? We love to criticize. We love to call out. We love to expose. We love to do these things because it makes us feel better about ourselves because maybe what that one person is doing is something you're not doing. And, and a lot of times it, it doesn't expose what's hidden in your closet. Hello. Let's slow it down. It's summertime. It's getting a little hot in here. The reality is that as, as we're doing things, and you're advancing the kingdom, it's very rare. It's very rare that, that you know that you're in front of something really special. That while you're doing something, you don't know how good it is until you see the fruit of your labor. You know, you rarely, I, I'll tell you this, I never thought that, that, that in starting the Holy One Church that we would be here today. I never thought that. It was, not, it was not like, hey, let's do this, let's do that. And by the time we get to the seventh and eighth year, we're going to have a group of people that got it all together. And no, 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 they're, 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 it was just not a plan that, that we would get here and be, what was it, 30, 40 of us? And look around you right now. Right now, we can't even have the children in here because it would not be room for everyone that is in this house today that we have to check in our children first just to make room for us i would have never known that it could have never been um um planned you know and 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 all this would i would have never known have known that we would be full-time ministry never would have thought that we would teach our children scripture teach them about the bible teach them music that one day we would be traveling with them for them to minister the gospel i would have never thought that ever we would have never thought that 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 one day we would be traveling to see them you see we did this we did this as 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 teenagers we would go and minister never thinking we would have children one day and be getting on a plane not them coming with us but us going with them so that they can spread the gospel you can't plan those things but you never know what you're in front of you never know that that every step that you're taking is producing a good work or the outcome that it's going to produce you just got to keep doing keep fighting keep rising up and at the end of the day, you'll see the front end <laughs> in retrospect. It's always looking back. It's like, wow, look at where we're at now. God is good. He is good. Now, the, the reality is that the, the good work is in, in the book of Nehemiah. As we see, the Babylonians had already destroyed Jerusalem. They destroyed the temple. The, the, the Babylonians had taken the Jewish people in captivity. You know, this still goes on in the world. There's Christians being taken captive. Things are being happened. But the city was completely destroyed. Decades later, some Jews were released to go back and to rebuild their homeland. And there was no economic system. There was no leadership structure. 
abs absolutely no hope. And everything that they tried to do failed. Then 140 years after this destruction, some ordinary guy, tell your neighbor, an ordinary guy. An ordinary guy. God has, there's something about God that, 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 that he finds the ordinary people. There's some of you that, that are exceptional, that are amazing, that when it comes to your grades, you always got the best. When it comes to your work, man, you, you fall up the top of the line, you know, and God can use you too. But there's something about God that he looks for the least. He looks for the ordinary and he finds that ordinary person and he raises them up so that they can be so that they can glorify God. Now, after after they had been broken hearted, uh, Nehemiah was broken hearted for his people. In other words, what broke Nehemiah's heart is to find out that his people were in ruin. Some of us hear about our friends and our family that are down the street and you're like, "Man, me vale." care less you look at what they did to me look at look at look at look at look at what they did to me 20 years ago and you're still thinking about that one time that one time they betrayed you that one thing that they did and Nehemiah wasn't thinking about all the things and the mistakes he didn't say man they deserved it because they had rebelled against God no he considered his people and this is how Christians should think that anyone that considers them the child of God you should lift them up you should strengthen them up you should not beat them down you should not tear them down but you should strengthen them build them up he was not a pastor Nehemiah wasn't a priest, he wasn't a warrior, he wasn't a contractor, he was not verified on Instagram or on Twitter, he was not, they, 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 none of, he was a cup bearer for the king of Persia. And we learned that a, a couple of weeks ago that the cup bearer is a person that if there's a hit on the king, hello, who's drinking that cup first? Cup bearer. So, so in other words, if there were poison in the, the, the king, he was going to be the one to drink the poison so that the king would live. But not only was he an ordinary guy, but he was a trustworthy guy. A man that could be beside the king, hear all the strategies of war and the things that were going on. And, and he was a trustworthy, ordinary man. A man that had to be at post at his job on time, all the time. We have lost the value of that. Christians just think, no, you know what? I'm going to show up when I show up. I'll be there when I get there. Hello. The reality is this, that when he realized all this, there was a, there, there's, there's things that we can learn about how he responded to the news. And according to the scripture in Nehemiah chapter 1, he sat down and he cried. And after he sat down and he cried, he knelt down and he prayed. And after he knelt down and he prayed, he stood up and he acted. Somebody has got to do something, he said. Somebody, so we can't just stay here. We can't, you, you know, and he didn't say, hey, you guys ought to do something. No, no, no. It might as well be me is what he said. He was a man that took action, and he, he, he realized that, it, man, if it's got to be me, i got to do it. The question today is, how do you do the good work? How do you start the work? How, how do you make a difference? And, and, and I want to give you four quick thoughts in how you can begin to make a difference, just like Nehemiah. And, and, and the first thing that we, we can do to make a difference is to seek God faithfully. Seek God. Hey, neighbor, seek God. Seek God faithfully. We see 12 times evidence where Nehemiah is praying. In, in the book of Nehemiah, we see 12 times. Those are the 12 times recorded. I know he didn't only pray 12 times. But there was 12 times that were recorded for us to be able to, to realize there, there's a model, there's a pattern, there's a way that we should come before God with our situations to begin the good work. 
So the first thing we should do is seek God faithfully. In this timeline, we, we see that, that he hears the news in the time of Kislev. And when we read this, when you hear Kislev, how many know what Kislev is? We don't know, right? But Kislev means between November and December. November, December roughly is Kislev. And then it says that he prayed to the month of Nisan. Now, we could do some dad jokes about Nisan, but no. You know what? He prayed to Nisan, which, which is about four months. Four months. I want you to realize, because we read these scriptures really quick, and it says in the time of Kislev, well, between the time of November, December, until the time of Nisan, which is four months, he prayed. Some of us are praying for a miracle. We'll come to one service and nothing happens and you stop. You give up. You show up two, three times a year and you're praying for God to make a difference in your marriage, make a difference in your relationship, make a difference in your kids, but you only show up to celebrate the birth and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you that that is not enough. It's not enough. It's not enough to just know about God's birthday or, or his death, burial, and resurrection. You've got to spend time. And Nehemiah spent four months after crying and breaking down, pleading to God that he would use me. Let's open our Bibles to the book of Nehemiah, chapter 2, verse 1. He prayed. He fasted. Pray. Now, now notice, not only did he pray, but he fasted. One of the big things in our lives today that the Christian church lacks is fasting. We do it for other reasons because we want to look slimmer. Hello? Or we got a doctor's appointment tomorrow and you don't want to show that you've been drink, drinking all those big reds or been showing that you be, have been eating all those donuts. So you'll fast so that you can trick the doctor so that when you come back, you get back to doing all the things you're doing wrong. So you're not helping yourself. Absolutely not helping yourself. Uh-oh. But fasting wasn't made for just the appointment. Or to look good, but to prepare you to enter the calling that God has for your life. To be able to be in the presence of God. So, so Nehemiah was praying and fasting. In Nehemiah um, chapter 2 verse 1, he said, I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me. Now, now he's, talking, he's standing before the king, right? And he's saying, man, I, I, I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. The king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to God of heaven and I answered the king. See, when it comes to prayer... Nothing is too big for God's power. Or nothing's too small for God's heart. We got to realize that, that when we're praying, we got we to gotta pray for our ministry and, 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 and our vision. Like there's got to be prayer. We, we spend time on Wednesdays before service praying. Not, not just to give you like a pre-concert because a lot of people may see it that way. It's not for that. It's to give you room, to give you space, to be able to come into the presence of God. Because some of us at home, we're distracted. No, but you get on your knees like, like y'all all do, right? Y'all get on y'all's knees at home, right? This is normal for everybody, right? You get on your knees at home to pray. I don't hear no amens. Saca la faja, like we used to do it. It's ridiculous. Actually, I, I, I've got to tell you, it's ridiculous that nobody prays anymore at home. But we create a space here, here at church so that you can come into the presence of God because at home, for whatever reason, you're distracted because, you know what, all the TVs are on, right? People are, Amazon keeps on showing up to the door, knocking and dropping the packages and going and you know what, you, you got to get the package because somebody's going to rob your stuff. 
So, so, you, so, so you don't got time to get on your knees because you're waiting for that package. You're waiting for that check in the mail, right? So, you, so there's distractions. The kids are running all around in the house, right? So, 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 so rather than being on our knees where they're mopping, doing all these other things. So we know already that our home is a distraction, right? Not only is it a distraction, that's why we're told to create a prayer room. How many have a prayer room, a, a spot? The prayer room doesn't have to be a room that you build to have, but a space that you make in your house or a place where you know that, man, when, I, when I'm in this room, and I'll tell you right now, it's not the restroom. Tell your neighbor, it's not the restroom. I, I, actually, I'll make a good correction today. Anyone that prays in the restroom is, is, is being disobedient to God because he says the word of God talks in Leviticus about bear, bearing the paddle and bearing the excrement and anything that you have before you go into the presence of God. So the last place you be, should be seeking the presence of God is while you're sitting on a toilet. That's the last place you should be praying. So make sure that you think about it before you try to get in the presence of God. Thank God for the grace of God because he's not going to strike you dead while you're sitting on the toilet because nobody wants to die on the toilet. But that's not the place that you seek the presence. And I say this, I mentioned it on Wednesday because we're always inviting people to the altar. When we open up the altar, I shouldn't be inviting you, although I'm going to keep inviting you. But you should not wait for the invitation. We make room so that you can pray. And Nehemiah, when he saw and he realized what was going on, it broke his heart. And he said, you know what? You got to do something. We got to do something. Because the reality is this, is prayer is necessary to accomplish the vision and the mission and, and the good work that God has in your life. And I tell you this, if, if you don't got a vision, you're not thinking big enough. Some of us don't think big enough. You, you, you got to think big. I drove my wife crazy when we were driving around looking for a church. When we were in a garage and we were looking for a church and I was looking at churches Two, three times bigger than this place. And, 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 and God made a way for this place to begin the good work. And he opened the door. Not only do, do we have a vision, but we have to be able to define the vision clearly, which is a second thought. Not, 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 only, not only are we seeking God faithfully, but we got to define the vision clearly. And for most people... We, we have a lack, or, 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 or it's not a lack of caring, but it's a lack of clarity of what we're doing, you know? So the way to do it is, is to put a vision, to write it down, you know, to make it very clear, to not complicate it. That's why our, our vision and our mission is very easy, to reach people far from God. How hard is that? Our, our vision at our church is to reach people far from God. And, and, and then when, when our, what our mission is, is to see what God is going to do through each and every one of you. So what does that mean for the church? That when we reach people far from God, are they going to stay here forever? Somebody don't know the, the answer doesn't mean we're going to stay here forever because every one of you has been given a vision a mission to be able to be ambassadors that means that you're going to do the good work everywhere that you go you're coming here some people will come as a refuge as escape maybe they've been church hurt we're reaching people far from God because maybe they don't want to go to, back to church because somebody screwed them over talked about them betrayed them and and the reality is is we open our doors to reach people that don't want to go back because they're are some mean Christians come on pray 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 he prayed pray he prayed and 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 the king asked Nehemiah what can I do in this picture as we're discussing what we're gonna do who's the king that's gonna ask us what can I do the king of kings God our father as we pray, as God sees our continents, as he sees us downcasted, as he sees us depressed, stressed, 
all the situation, whether you're going through a financial situation, if you're going through a, a, a sickness, if you're going through a relational situation, if you plead and give it to God, God will turn around and ask you, what can I do for you? Nehemiah 2 verse 4 says, if it pleases the king, I wish we had that courtesy to tell the Lord, if it pleases you, God. Because some of us don't even go there. Lord, this is what I need you to do. Dad, I need you to do this. I need to, Dad, I need you to empty your bank account, put it in my bank account. Dad, I need you to fix my car, sort my situation, fix my marriage, straighten out my kids, straighten, oh, come on, do something about my boss. And, and, and you, 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 that's usually the way we approach the king. Rather begin, if it pleases you, God, if it pleases you, king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight. This is a prayer teaching moment. And if, Lord, I have found favor in you, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. He, he is a man with a broken heart, sees a need. It broke him, and he had a response. And he said, Lord, if it pleases you, if it be your will, will you, Father, send me to the mission? Send me to the, to the homeless. Send me to the sex traffic kids. Send me to the elderly. Send me to the schools. Send me to the workplace. Send me to my children. Send me to your people. Send me to our people. Send me to the nations. Send me, Lord, if it be your will. And if you're pleased with me, Lord, please send me to Judas so that I can rebuild the city. He didn't say, hey, uh, 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 Lord, you know... Um, Es que Pedro está en, en, en San Francisco y pues sabes que tiene los dos niños ahí el, el, y, y, y está María ahí, todos ahí que, eh, ah, ah, Dios, es, es que quiero ir para allá. I want to go over there. Y, y, y me quieren ahí porque tengo talentos and they want to use me and, and I can make a difference there, Lord Father God. If I get there, um, eh, puedo comenzar el negocio because I know how to make some carne guisada, some good carne guisada and some barbacoa because California don't know how to make some good carne guisada and they don't <laughs> know how to make some good tortillas. They really don't. Hasta, we need some tortillas in Puerto Rico too. But, you know, if I get there, I can, you know, I can try to figure this out and sort it out. And, and Lord, sabes que, uh, uh, no sé, pero uh, tengo un pension, uh, I'll cash that out and work it out and sort it out. And al cabo, you know what, uh, tengo mis niños, pueden trabajar, I'll put them to work so I can figure this out myself. And then I'll, I'll, I'll check in with you later and see if you'll sort it out. Imagine if we came to the Lord without a clear vision of what to do. We come with story. I, I've gotten dismissals that way. <laughs> no, it's good. No, 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 no. I know God didn't call you. You just got upset con el hermano, el hermana, y ya te vas. The way it works, right? The reality is this. But when you have a clear vision, a clear plan, a clear motive, a clear heart and a clear mind into what you're doing, you don't have to come with all your pettiness all your excuses, Lord, if you have found favor in your servant, use me. Lord, no matter what, I will stand in the gap. If everyone turns their back on me, if my family turns their back on me, I'm going to speak about Jesus. I'm going to lift people up rather than when people are angry at me, when they throw hate at me, and when they throw shade at me. Oh, I'm going to bless them, Lord.
I am going to lift them up because I'm going to glorify your name. We don't live in a place like that. We need to be there. But the reality is this. That we, 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 it's not a problem. We, we, we don't have a lack of caring. Every, everyone cares here. The problem is clarity. I want to help children. We need to help children. I need more children volunteers. Very clear. The vision here at the Holy One Church. We need more children volunteers. We need more people faithful to the call. Who are broken hearted enough to not be worried about what anyone else thinks. But say, you know what? When I get to the Holy One Church, I'm going to serve despite the hell that's going on in my house. Despite the hell that's going on at work. I'm going to stand in the gap. Lord, if you find favor in me, use me. I am available. I, I want to be available. Maybe, maybe it's serving in the medical field. A lot of you work in the medical field right now. God is calling you. After the betrayal during the pandemic, there, there needs to be a rise of Christians that will stand in the gap and say enough is enough. The word of God says. We got to be able to step in our government and say the word of God says. We got to be able to say enough is enough. Walk into targets and say enough is enough. Walk into Walmarts, wherever it is. Show up to Disney and say enough is enough. Be able to stand in the gap. What breaks your heart? Doesn't it break your heart that you can't just let your kids watch whatever anymore? It breaks my heart that I have to babysit. So rather than babysitting, I'm like, man, you ain't going to watch nothing until I realize what you're watching. Now you got Disney Channel showing kids all these little Satan, little episodes, little demon. It's literally called a series called Demon. And, and it's a cartoon thing. It looks cute. But the reality is there's a conditioning. And, and if it breaks your heart, maybe you're that one person that creates like pure flicks. It's nothing but Christian, you know. There are people, you know what broke their heart. There are people that will create Bibles. There are people that will create things to make a move. Finally, what is God leading you to do? What, what is he leading you to do? To lead your family? Maybe to become totally debt-free, right? Like, do you have a plan to become debt-free? It, it, maybe, maybe it's a personal conversation about Jesus with, with everyone at your workplace, right? The work can't impose it on you. The school can't impose it on you. But we got freedom of speech. And if you don't use it, that's on you, Right? Maybe, it, maybe for you is to make a decision because you've got a high-paying job and you're in the oil field and you're on this to, to figure out how to donate 100000 to the, the Holy One Church within the next five years. Hallelujah. The problem is that there's so much thought and manipulation. I hate the fact that I see so many Christians. I, I know there are bad people in churches. I get that. I see it all the time. I see all the false comments. But I'll tell you this. Put the money in here and you know exactly we're expanding this place. We're figuring it out. I'm telling you there's been investment into this building. How many enjoying the temperature right now? Because it was pretty hot Wednesday. And I tell you this, we do a lot to, 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 to build comfort. Or maybe some of you are, 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 are want to serve the youth during our Unite Youth to help, to help youth break from porn addiction. Because the reality is one of the biggest things in Christianity is that there are more Christians hooked on porn. Uh-oh. It, it's a big, it's, it, forget the pandemic, it's a pandemic of porn in church. Like, oh, man, for some of you, it's just like, it, it, it's going to hit because, you know what? It's just so messed up. We got, uh, the, the reality is this, I, and I, I, I'm, I'm going to help some of you today. Uh-oh. I'm going to help some of you because the reality is this. We now live in a, a time where you don't realize it, but the things that you like, people get to see what you like. So if you like bikinis, si te gusta, you know, whatever it is. Whatever, people working out or twerking or whatever it is that you like. Like, people that are watching you get to see what you like. 
And you don't know that they get to see what you like. I'll tell you this today. Fix it before you get exposed. It's easier to fix it before you get exposed because the reality is this. God has not called us to be distraction distracted by those things how can we re rebuild all these things if we're just here stuck on our phones and we can't even share our phones God, i tell you this if you can't share your phone you got a problem <laughs> come on like my, my kids come and get my phone which means that it has to be secure from nonsense because if it's not then my kids will be exposed to the very thing that i don't want them to be exposed at so I train myself, tell, your, tell yourself, train myself. I train myself to make sure I have every device, everything secured so that everyone around me. I used to work at the bank all the time. And the, the one common thing that everyone would always do is, help, can you help me download the, the bank app so that I can get into my account? And the first thing that would pop up when they'd hand me their phone is a porn they were watching. I was like, Lord, have mercy. Oh, I'm sorry. I forget you're a minister of God. Lying devil, you knew exactly what you were doing. The reality is, is that you'll get exposed. Unfortunately, a lot of them that would try to hide it, I'd see their bank statement. I already knew where they were at, buying all that stuff. So I tell you today, don't wait. And this goes across all the boards. And maybe you're not, it's poor. Maybe you're hooked on coke and, and meth or maybe it's just pills or whatever you're on. The reality is this. Don't wait till you're in the hospital and we're having to pray. So what's wrong with you? Well, you know, pastor, I'm just sorry, but man, I, I, I've been on, hooked on coke while I was serving at your church this whole time. You know, like what? Like the reality is it. Deal with it. We got what breaks your heart and you got which brings us to the third thought. Make plans carefully. Not only give yourself a vision, but give, you a go give, give yourself a goal with, with, with a plan to be able to do the wishes of God. Look at, look at what Nehemiah 2, 6 through 8 says. Then the king with the queen sitting beside him, notice that the queen was beside him, and asked me, how long will your journey take? And when will you get back? Obviously, the king valued his cupbearer because he wanted him back when are you going to come back it pleased the king to send me so i set a time in other words when 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 god allows you set a time frame make a plan and i also said to him if it pleases a king may i have letters to the governors of trans euphrates so that they will provide me safe conduct until i arrive in judah in other words provide me protection Woo. and may i have a letter to asaph keeper of the royal park so that he will give me timber and to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple for the city wall for the residence i will occupy and because a gracious hand of my god was on me the king granted my request. I'm telling you right now, find favor with God. Let go of the nonsense. The, find favor with God. Find yourself in prayer. Repent. Get away from your sins so that you can come to the king. And guess what he's going to do? Provide you protection. Provide you finances for your journey. Many of us say we, we try to figure it out with our own strength our own finances, and God's saying, wait, come to me. Let me find favor in you. I will give you protection. I will give you provision. I will protect you. I will provide for you. My name is Jehovah Jireh. He <coughs> your plan doesn't need to be perfect. Tell your neighbor, your plan doesn't need to be perfect. You just got to have a plan. And if it's ministry, find somebody. Find out who's doing it. You know, find out where they're meeting. Take a tour of a church. Try to figure it out. It, it, you know, ask questions. If it is that God's calling you to ministry. Or maybe it's an idea that you have. 
Take some online classes. Find a, find a mentor or, or write a business plan. Oh, I'm going to start this business. Well, let me, let me see your business plan. Well, I haven't figured it all out. No, no, no. Get your plan together. You got to have a plan, you know. Maybe, maybe for some of you, you just want to you wanna go on a date finally. Hello. Let me help you. Take a bath. <laughs> Buy a new shirt collar. Go to South Park Mall. <laughs> Where the girls go. Hello. They're adding more stores, right? Go to, go to Walmart where the girls go for looking for things that don't, they don't need. Okay. Help some of you out. Take a bath. Success isn't accomplished somewhere in the future. It's, it's, it's the right thing today. So we got to seek God faithfully. Say, seek God faithfully. Dev- define the vision clearly. Make plans. And finally, inspire people passionately. What's coming? What's going to come? Opposition? You know? Discouragement? That's what happens every, every Sunday sermon, uh, service. <laughs> You're excited? We're in cloud nine in Jesus. You leave this place and you face opposition. Someone you, somebody dropped something. Hey, pues oíste del pastor, pues estaba en Puerto Rico. Look, they were on the beach. Ya sabes dónde va toda la feria. Like, I, I hear some of the dumbest things, you know. Thank God the beaches are free. Whew. Hey. It's U.S. territory. <laughs> We were walking through hotels, and, and we, weren't, we weren't guests of those hotels. Are you a guest here? No, I'm just trying to access the beach. Oh, yes, we just need your name. You can go through. That's right, because it's U.S. territory. We're in Puerto Rico, baby. Yeah, I, I've learned that. You know, I've been, I've been punked at some people. You know, people have private access to the river. They're like, hey, th- we own this property in Tararan. Let me stand in the river. You don't own this. I, kids, stay in the river. We'll walk up on down this river because it don't belong to you. It belongs to my Lord Savior. It belongs to the Creator. You're going to face opposition. You're going to face discouragement. You're going to face distraction. You're going to face fatigue. Christians get tired too. But I'll tell you this. Is it worth it? Is this worth it? It's worth it. It's worth it. And it's even, it's possible. Look at what Nehemiah 2.17 says. Then I said to him, you see the trouble we are in? Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of God on me and the king had said to me, And what they said to me, we got to inspire people to faith because God is for them. God is with them. And God is empowering them to do something that matters, something that makes a difference. John Wesley, who is believed to have set up the Methodist church denomination said this quote once day once he said light yourself on fire with passion and people will come from miles to watch you burn see the world when you're when you're lost they'll watch you while you pour gasoline it's very rare that somebody will knock the lighter out of your hand they'll take out their phone first But John Wesley says this, just the way they do that to make their point, let's light ourselves on fire. Now, we're not talking about gas. We're talking about spiritual. Light yourself on fire with passion and people will come from miles to watch 
you burned with passion, with favor, with blessing, with an outpouring of the gospel. And I tell you this, God ain't done with you yet. Let's stand to our feet. What you care about isn't an accident. That conviction you have, it's there because God has placed it there. God is filling heaven with people that have a passion. People are building churches because God is creating a revival. And, and what you care about isn't by accident. God knew what he was doing when he made you. And the burden that you bear reveals the difference that you will make. The burden that you bear. Some of us don't have a burden. You're getting one today. I'll tell you this. So many people are getting knocked out. There's, there, you, you, what, you heard a few months ago, there was all these revivals. And then it slowed down a second because it got real hot, right? But it's our job to keep revival going the problem in church and this is a real problem is that many people come and they put a front that it's all good it's good how's it going it's good but it's not really good and you got to be able to break down find that conviction find what hurts you it hurts me that my children are lost it hurts me that my family don't go to church it hurts me that my, my job imposes a world on me and I can't speak about the gospel. It hurts me that, that I'm seeing that Christians being taken out because they won't confess their sins. It hurts me. What hurts you? What bothers you? And if you don't care about anything, you need Jesus today. Because you should be caring about everything that belongs to Jesus. You should be caring about everyone. And the reality is for some of you, you should be celebrating because your kids are here today in church. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. For some of you, it's your mom and your father or, or your daughter, or your son that are here today. Thank you, Jesus. Maybe for some of you, it's your friend. Well, thank you, Jesus. You are in this house and you are not alone. And for some of you, you don't see that someone. But thank you, Jesus, that he's going to make a way where there seems to be no way. And some of you right now may feel like, hey, I don't even know what the heck I'm doing here. Well, thank you, Jesus, because you made it here. And God is about to fill you. God is about to mold you. God is about to give you clarity. Well, no, I can do it my own way. He's going to remove your addictions. He's going to remove your desires. You may think, well, I'm good right now. But when you're no good, you don't want to be waiting till you're on a deathbed finding Jesus. Find him now while he can still be found, says in Revelation. Find him now while you can still find him. I tell you this. God is calling many of you. And some of you, I can see you right now. You're like, man, what the heck am I doing here? But I tell you this. You're at the right place at the right time. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you. And we begin the good work today, Lord. Recognizing that we're not abandoned. We may be pressed down, but we're not destroyed. <laughs> We may be persecuted, Father God, but Father God, you're giving us strength. And although I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I, we shall fear no evil, Father God. For the days are coming, Lord, when you're going to loosen and allow Satan to do his bidding. He's going to do his work. And I really believe, Lord, your people are not ready, but we're getting ready. Tell your neighbor, we're getting ready. We're getting ready, Lord, Father God, for what's to come. You know, the, the reality is many of us are carrying a lot of demons, are carrying a lot of things that are going to, they got to be cleansed out. You got to 
you, you, I'm not telling you to run to a witches or none of that stuff. I'm telling you to give your life to Jesus because Jesus is the answer. He's going to give you strength. He's going to give you fortitude. He's going to provide for your needs. He is that God. But you come to him not, not telling him what to do. Lord, if you have found favor in me, if, if it be your will, Lord, today, use me. 